Good morning, everyone. Um, this is part two of our Crowd Dab Derby this year. And the third event that we've been doing this morning for Girl Scouts Love State Parks Weekend. So thank you for joining us. Um, I hope we have some uh, return visitors from our last couple programs. And if you're a Girl Scout and want to say, well, even if you're not, want to say hello to us, let us know your name and where you're from in the Q&A. Um, my name is Alyssa, like I said, um, and I'll be handling questions along with Ryan, who is with our Scenic Rivers program at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And so say hi to us, let us know where you're from. And then also with me today to talk about clean water um, is Heather Doherty from our uh, Scenic Rivers program. And we have friends from our Muskingum, is it Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District? It's a long name, I don't want to get it wrong. Lewis? Is Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District. Okay, good. Um, we have Lewis and who you can't see on camera right now. We also have Kara and Matt. So thank you to our friends there for joining us. And I'm going to send it uh, to Heather for just a, a second to talk about the rest of the Crowd Out Derby. I will put a link in the Q&A box to the rest of our events. Um, and then we'll, we'll hand it over to Lewis. All right. Well, thank you, Alyssa, and thank you all for watching. This is, as Alyssa mentioned, this is the second of three segments that are comprising our virtual Mohican Crawdad Derby today. Uh, this is the third year that we're doing this event. Hopefully um, next year we're going to be back in person at Mohican State Park, um, which is a great place um, to catch crawdads. But today we're going to learn um, we just learned about crowd ads. Um, in this segment, we're going to talk about um, what they mean in terms of uh, water quality and how clean our water is. So crowd ads and other animals that live in the water can tell us a lot about the, the shape our rivers are in. And also um, our friends at Muskegon Watershed Conservancy District, I'm so happy that they're partnering with ODNR today on this, on this uh, program, are going to tell us about how water pollution happens um, and how we can prevent it from happening and keep our water clean. So I think we're going to hand it over to Louis. Thank you, Heather. My name is Louis Anders. I'm a naturalist here with Muskegon Watershed Conservancy District here at Pleasant Hill Lake. Uh, Pleasant Hill Lake is important because we provide the water downstream to Mohican River, which is part of a scenic rivers as well as other rivers in this area. So as a watershed district uh, here in Ohio, we were created in 1933. Uh, we're 20% of the state of Ohio. So you can, we cover a large percentage of the state. We're the largest conservation district in the state. We're comprised of 16 uh, dams. Uh, all of them are earthen dams, except one is concrete. And all, we have 10 permanent reservoirs as well. One of those lakes or two of those lakes in this area of Ohio is uh, Pleasant Hill Lake and Charles Mill Lake. And both of those Muskingum Watershed Parks have camping that you can bring your troop. We have naturalist activities where you can um, go to programs for naturalists. We have all kinds of things and we're open year round. So just don't think this is a summertime activity. You can come in the fall, the winter, all year round and things. The different thing we have are boating, fishing, hiking, camping, all those things that you would like to do in the outdoors. We're made up, you can see the different types of different dams that we have throughout Ohio. And one of the things we want to get across about water is that's very important. Everything requires water to live. And all this water will flow down into the Ohio River uh, and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. So all the water, even though it's in your sink, will flow down and eventually will end up in the ocean. What's really amazing about water is it's only made up of two elements hydrogen and oxygen, and sometimes referred to as H2O, because that's two molecules of hydrogen and one of oxygen. The water covers about 75% of our planet. So we are basically a water planet and everything, every living thing needs water, including us. And we are made up about 50% water. So it's important that we have clean water 
so that we can survive on this planet. What other amazing thing about water is it can be a liquid in a form of water. It could be a solid as ice or glaciers, or it could be a gas, which are going to be clouds. So it's one of the only elements that has all three of those properties. Uh, the other amazing thing about water is it can be recycled. So the same water we're drinking today was water that maybe the dinosaurs drank or bison or people thousands of years ago drank. So we recycle that. And one of the things we're going to be talking about how it's important to protect our water and keep clean water and protect it from pollution. We're going to uh, show you uh, how water influences the different things that you can do in in your backyard or whatever. So we have this model here. This is called an Enviroscape. And what it shows, it shows different areas, maybe in your community, uh, maybe in your backyard. All these things, how they influence water quality. So over in this section here, we have a construction area. This area have a parking lot. Uh, kind of like a shopping plaza here. Here we have a forested area, an open green space in this area here. We have roads, they're important. We have bridges. We have a wastewater treatment plant here. Over here we have agriculture. Most of the state of Ohio is agriculture, so this is a very important component as far as water quality is working with our farmers uh, as far as maintaining a manure and different fertilizers and things. And then we have our lake. So this would be like Pleasant Hill Lake. These would be our farm areas, golf courses, all the different things that affect our landscape here. One of the things that we want to get across is how water moves. In a liquid form, we have water. If we have hard surfaces, like this hard surface here would be like a parking lot. If we take and have a rain event, so I'll use a spray bottle as a rain event. When I spray that. See how all that water just runs off immediately? But if we have a green space area and this sponge is going to represent the grass, which is this green area here, when the rain is, hits this surface, it's absorbed. It doesn't run off right away. And that's what we want to create in these environments. So these green things, you'll see these different sponges and things. This is representing those forest areas here or those grass areas or wetland areas that we're collecting the water. And that's very, very important as far as controlling runoff, sediment, and also collecting uh, pollutants and stuff. A lot of these little wetland areas act as kidneys, like in our body, the kidneys purify the water and get the toxins out. Same thing with wetland areas. That's what they do. They're the kin, the kin, kin uh, golly, the kidneys of our environment here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some things that represent one of the things that we hear a lot about in litter is plastic. And what, what we have here is coconut, and we're going to represent this as this may be some litter out on the parking lot area. We have some litter out on the roads. And one of the biggest problems with litter is plastic, and particularly plastic bags. And when these are floating in the water like the ocean and everything, uh, whales and animals that depend on eating so a lot of it like jellyfish, this looks like a jellyfish floating in the water. So they'll eat a bunch of these bags and there's no nutrition value and it fills up their stomach and the animals end up starving to death. So it's really important that we go ahead and protect the environment by collecting the bags and not making sure they get into our waterway. Another thing that we do, and these are herbicides, and this is actually soy sauce. Now this stuff is toxic that we're putting down here. So if you have a farm area, we're actually putting some herbicides and things on the croplands to keep the plants. Another thing that we do is have manure, and that's a key component, especially in, for, in uh, farm areas. So we have these little jimmies here that's going to act as manure here. And also even in our own house, we have manure because we have uh, dog waste, dog poo and things. So we're going to put some by there. Another thing that we have that's a problem is motor oil, and this is maple syrup. And what we're going to do is if we have a car here that's leaking oil onto the roadway, I'll put that there. Maybe we have some in the parking lot. We have some oil that's dripping in the parking lot. So one of the things that we need to do is make sure our cars are in good shape that's not leaking out these things. Another thing we have are pesticides. 
So we're going to put this red here as pesticides over in the farm area. And then in our own backyards, we have grass clippings and things. So here we have some uh, oregano. We're going to put some stuff with it like that. We got some other things. So we're going to put a lot of different stuff here. Here's some unprotected soil. So it's going to be our sediment. Then what happens is we have a rain event. So we're going to imitate this. This is going to be the clouds that are coming in. And if you can see, as we have the water, the rain come down, all these things eventually are going to end up in the stream area. Go over in the farm area, we have all the different things flowing in there. The manure from the unprotected, that pesticides. You can see the hard surfaces right here on the parking lots. It's running off right away. But where we have sponges at, it's soaking that up. So if you look at our water source down here at the lake, you can see all these things are running into our lake area. So no matter if it's happening up in a construction area, the parking area of maybe your local grocery store, the forest area, golf course, all these things, agriculture, all this stuff is all interconnected. And this is what we call a watershed. And a watershed is where we're going to be storing water above ground in lakes, rivers, and streams and underground in wetland areas and aquifers. So most of our fresh water is stored underground. And about 20% of the fresh water is in the Great Lake region, which Ohio joins the Great Lakes. So you can see how all this is interacted. Something you do with your car or at your house is going to eventually end up in the waterway and everything will end up in the ocean. So a couple of things that we can do and help protect this is just where we're at. We're going to keep this as our watershed area. A watershed is very similar to maybe a sink or your bathtub in your house and everything goes down the drain, comes out into the watershed. So in your house, you have all these little mini watersheds, very similar to Ohio. We have Muskegon, we have Miami River, we have all these different watersheds. There's just not one watershed, they're all a lot of small ones. So all of them run into rivers and all of them will eventually end up into the ocean. So whatever we do has a thing in the ocean. Okay, we'll turn it over to Heather. All right. Thank you. Thank you, um, Louie. I um, am going to talk about um, our um, how we can measure if our rivers are clean. So Louie was just talking about um, uh, potential pollution that can get into our river. Um, but we want to know um, if we have pollution in our river, how do we tell? How do you measure if your stream is healthy? Um, and I want to, I want to, before I jump into that, I want to mention that I work with the Ohio Scenic River Program, and as a part of the Mohican Crawdad Derby, we're celebrating our scenic rivers today. Um, and also, um, we're excited that we're working with Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District, and our Mohican Scenic River is a part of the bigger uh, Muskingum Watershed. So. All right, so if we maybe have pollution issues, how do we tell? How can we measure if your stream is clean? Um, well, you can look for pollutants in the water. So Louie just mentioned fertilizer um, or manure or pet waste, um, things that run off the land and into the water when it rains. So you can look for those things in the water um, and after I'm done, we're going to go back to the Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District and they're going to talk about how you measure some of those things. Um, and so, um, but you can also look for what lives in the water. Um, and with the Ohio Scenic River Program, we spend a lot of time doing that. We look for water bugs. So water bugs are also called macro invertebrates, which is a big word. Um, Macro means big, so does not require a microscope. When I'm done, um, Matt and Muskegon Watershed Conservation District is going to look at some things you can look at with a microscope, but right now we're talking about big stuff um, that you don't need a microscope for. And we're also going to, um, invertebrates um, have no bones. So 
We're looking for water bugs or macro vertebrates that are big, don't have bones. Um, they can tell us a lot about stream health. So is a crawdad a macro invertebrate? Well, is it big enough to be seen without a microscope? Yes. Does it have bones? No, it doesn't. It does not have bones like you and I. It has a hard outer shell called an exoskeleton. So other types of water bugs that we can look for. Um, this little guy is called a scud. It's a type of crustacean, just like um, crawdads. You can look for clams, snails, um, lots of insect and um, baby insects called insect larvae um, live in our streams. Different types of worms are all types of macroinvertebrates that we can look for and you can look for in waterways. So if you're in a river, um, and you're looking to find some of these creatures, the best place to look is in an area called a riffle. So you can see here in this picture, um, the water is shallow, it's moving fast, it's breaking over rocks. Um, that's where a lot of our macroinvertebrates live because here the water is higher in oxygen. These bugs need oxygen just like you do. Um, and it also, the, the bottom of the stream tends to be a little cleaner here with, and not as muddy because the water is moving fast and pushing that stuff out of the way. So we look for bugs in riffles. Um, you can use a net to find bugs. Here I am with, with my daughter who is also a Girl Scout. Um, I have a net that I set on the bottom of the stream. She is kicking her feet um, in the stream bottom. And that disturbs some of our um, water bugs that live in and on the stream bottom. Um, and then they flow with the current into the net. So you can use that technique or you can just flip a rock over and you'll find lots of bugs like these clinging to the bottom of the rock. So why do they do that? Why are they on the bottom of the river? Why are they kind of stuck to the rocks like this? And not, not all bugs do this, but many of them do. Um, how does this help them? Well, they don't want to become fish food. So if you're in and under the rocks and sticking to them, you're much less likely to float down the river and be eaten by fish. Um, this is a type of fish that lives in our um, riffles as well and our some of our streams called a darter. Um, and we have lots of different species of darters. They can get really colorful. This is a rainbow darter. I think it's amazing. It's, you know, a, not well known that we have these tropical looking fish in Ohio, but they sit on the river bottom um, and they eat those water bugs are their prey. So fish like to cling, or the bugs cling to the bottom of the rocks so they don't get eaten by fish. Um, other things that you can find if you flip a rock over um, on the far left, the little um, bug with two long tails is a stone fly and the, the one that looks like it has three tails is a mayfly. And below we also have a caddisfly larva and a little bug called a water penny. All of these um, organisms you can find by flipping a rock over in a riffle if you're in a high quality stream. Um, all of them are larvae of insects. So these are baby insects that will become adults um, that live um, on land. So a lot of our um, water bugs that are insects have this kind of life cycle where they start off um, as flying insects. They lay eggs in the water. The eggs hatch into nymphs or larvae. Then they emerge as adults. Um, so mayflies, if you're going fly fishing, a mayfly, a caddisfly, a stonefly, or all types of flies that you may imitate with your flies if you're going fly fishing. And because they have part of their, uh, their life cycle uh, in the water, that's one of the reasons that fish know what they are um, and find them very tasty. Um, so these are very important to our um, fish and the rest of our food web. Here is a, um, another picture of a mayfly. Um, a lot of our bugs have um, superpowers for survival, and I've stolen some of these ideas from Ryan, who's working behind the scenes today. Um, mayflies have strength. 
They have strength in numbers as one of their superpowers for survival. If everything, if you have a lot of predators, how do you survive? Well, they're, they survive by hatching as adults all at once. There's some species that live in Lake Erie that come out in such numbers that they cover cars, they cover streets. Um, they all come out at once. And because there's so many of them, they can't, uh, the predators can't eat them all and some of them survive. So their, their strength is in sticking together and being a big group, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, this little guy is a caddisfly larva. Its superpower is invisibility. So it makes this little case, those are little bits of sand and rock that it sticks together um, with silk and it carries it around with it. So not only is that case um, camouflaged, but that caddisfly can disappear inside. So it's it's kind of like a hermit crab. I've been to rivers and just sitting in the water, I've occasionally seen these guys just walking around with their case, which is pretty cool. Um, so it's gonna turn into an adult that looks something like that. This guy also has the power and visibility. Look how camouflaged it is on that rock. Um, it is called a water penny. Um, it also is shaped just like a suction cup. So it really sticks to those rocks and it scrapes the bacteria and algae off the rocks and that's what it eats. Um, so this is what it looks like when it's an adult. As an adult, it lives on the edge of water. It can go in the water, but mostly lives, I find them a lot on rocks um, right at the water's edge on land. So, um, okay, so what do these bugs have to tell us about the health of our rivers? Um, well, at the Ohio Scenic River Program, we do a lot of monitoring with volunteers um, for these types of organisms. And what we do um, is use a net, like you can see this woman holding in this photo. Um, and you put the net on the stream bottom, someone else stands upstream and shuffles their feet in the, in the stream bottom and all of that uh, if you disturb any bugs that live in the stream bottom they will flow into the net then you take the net to the side like these uh, girls have done um, and you have an id sheet um, to look at um, and you try to figure out what you found um, so we call this process stream quality monitoring we've been doing it since 1983. We do it on all of our 15 scenic rivers um, statewide. So we have 150 sites. So we've collected a lot of information about our streams. And what we do is we look for what we found um, and we look at, we have this, I, this uh, identification sheet and it breaks our water bugs into groups. Some of them are really sensitive to pollution. So the, all those organisms that you see there at the top are sensitive species, which means if there's a lot of pollution in the water, they can't live there anymore. So if you find them, um, they indicate that your water is pretty clean, which is why they're called indicator species. So, yeah, they're yes. So um, I have a question. Sure. Okay. And we know, as you said, that they're indicator species, but she is wondering, do the water bugs help clean the rivers? Um, mm. And I just want to let all the other Girl Scouts or viewers who are watching, uh, just a reminder, if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A and we will get to them shortly. All right, thank you. That is a good question. Actually, I think there's one of them. You can see in the middle of this little group, that's a clam, um, and we do have lots, lots of um, clams and freshwater mussels that live in our rivers. They are filter feeders, so that means they bring the water into their bodies um, and they um, eat little particles um, that are in the water, and then they push the rest of the water back out of their body. So in a way, they are um, they are filtering our water a little bit. I know the rest of them, I'm not sure that's a good question. They probably do a little bit because they're eating little particles of things that are in the water. Um, but that's a really good question. 
I think what really helps clean the water is, um, you know, we're not getting into it today, but what really helps clean the water is forests along the river. And that's something that we do a lot of um, at Scenic Rivers is try to protect those forests. So if there's, Louie was talking about all that rain um, that can wash pollutants into the water, but if you have trees and forests next to the river, those plants help absorb a lot of that pollution and help keep the water clean. So, all right, so back to our bugs. Um, all these bugs here in the top section are sensitive to pollution. If you have a lot of pollution in your water, you're not gonna find them there. Um, then these guys in the middle, including our crawdads, are somewhat sensitive. So they can live with a little bit of pollution. Uh, this also includes dragonfly larvae, which is pretty cool. They live in our rivers and in lakes too. And then down at the bottom are species that um, are very tolerant to pollution and can live anywhere. So um, we can actually, when we find these, when we go back here, um, use our net, identify what we have. Um, you can give points to these different um, organisms that you find and generate a score, and then you can track that score over time. And that's what we do with um, volunteers on our scenic rivers and it helps us keep an eye on the rivers and let us know if there's problems um, with pollution that we need to go out and, and work on. So um, when we go out, um, we want to find uh, species from all over that sheet. So we want, um, you want a mixture of things and the, the more different types of bugs you have, the better. So in this tray, I don't know, there's six or seven different species. Um, uh, and the, the more the better. And again, I want to point out this guy right here in the center is a dragonfly larva. They're pretty cool. They live um, in our rivers and they're one of our biggest macroinvertebrates. Um, this guy is our biggest one. He's called a helgramite. They're really cool. Actually, I don't know if it's a boy or a girl. Could be either. Um, they're one of our biggest and uh, best indicators of clean water. They're very sensitive to pollution. So stream quality monitoring is great as a teaching tool. We go out and work with um, schools um, doing this and there's all kinds of science standards um, that can be taught um, through doing this. It's also great um, to a great way for the community to be involved in their river, to be eyes and ears on the river um, and understand um, what the rivers need to, to stay clean. If you'd like to volunteer, you can email um, Christine Cheminsky at dnr.state.oh.us. That's a really long um, email address to write down. So um, Alyssa is gonna put it in the Q&A right now. Um, we are not currently uh, training new volunteers because we can't meet with them one-on-one -on -one due to our COVID-19 protocols, but we'll certainly add you to a list um, and get you trained next year. And what we do is we host workshops to train people to how to, how to go out and do that. So we're Hopefully we'll be back to doing that next year. <coughs> and I wanna challenge all of our viewers out there to go and find a water bug. Um, um, if you do, you can also use our Scenic Rivers activity book. Um, Ryan, who you met earlier, um, beautifully illustrated this book. It features crawdads and many of the other macroinvertebrates that we just spoke about, including our dragonfly nymphs um, with coloring pages and activity sheets. Um, fun puzzles and games, but also lots to learn about um, our macroinvertebrates. So if you want to know more about uh, the scenic rivers, we're in the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves. You can follow us and um, Ohio DNR. So that, that um, concludes my presentation. And I think we're going to hand it back to Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District. Hello, I'm Matt Thomas with Muskingum Watershed. I coordinate the water quality program uh, and we look at water quality for all 10 lakes within the watershed. And today I'm going to show you uh, how we test for bacteria, harmful bacteria and beneficial bacteria that's in the water. And I want to show you some of the larger animals, larger plankton that live in the lake. Uh, these are not macroinvertebrates. These are microinvertebrates. So if we look here, <clears throat> I have several water samples. One is uh, just tap water, drinking water. There should be no bacteria in that whatsoever. Um, 
this morning I went out and I scooped some lake water from Pleasant Hill. It looks a lot like tap water, but there's actually a lot of life that's in, in our lake water. And that's a good thing. We want that. Um, and then I, what I did, I took a net and I concentrated that lake water down and they, I filtered all the small microscopic life that's in there into this sample. And so we basically go from uh, no animals, no bacteria, to bacteria, to a, a concentrated sample from the lake. And we're going to look at uh, these up close and personal in a minute, and it'll be really cool. One of the questions was, how does do any of these animals clean the water? Bacteria, good bacteria actually help clean the water. We want a uh, good bacteria population in the water. OK. We'll get to that in a second. To concentrate the water, we need special tools. Uh, scientists use a neat little tube thing. This is a, a plankton net, and basically everything goes in the hole. This is underwater, and the, the plankton gets concentrated down here, and we're left with that nice thick sample. Well, not everyone has these, um, so you can use a PVC tube with a screen on the bottom of it, uh, coffee filters from the kitchen. That works to slowly pour the water through there and you can concentrate what you want to see in that filter. Um, next thing, you want to magnify that. So I have a microscope back here that we're going to look uh, at our sample. You might not have microscope at home, maybe you do at school. Uh, these little microscopes or magnifying glasses work just as well. So once we concentrate our, our sample down, <clears throat> we can we can then test it for bacteria. We put uh, we use a color test and uh, I have some sheets, these little bubble sheets here. This is a bac E. coli bacteria test. And so we have to look at the colors and it's really simple. There's not a lot of numbers or math involved. Um, so this is clear. Uh, we're also going to see the color yellow. And then I have a special lamp that shows ultraviolet light. We don't have to turn off the light now, but um, it will glow blue. So if you look at our samples, this first one in the test, this is, uh, this is our tap water. There's no yellow. Yellow means good bacteria in the water. And I'm going to turn off the lights here. And if it's it's not really glowing, so that means there's no bad bacteria in the water. So our next sample is our good bacteria, and there's no glowing yellow or glowing blue, excuse me. So that's good. And our third sample here if there's some yellow and then you can see there is some glowing blue and that tells us there's a mix of good bacteria and bad bacteria in the water and that's expected uh, the e coli that's in the lakes uh, that that's a natural we just don't want it to be too much here's a another sample from another uh, a farm pond nearby basically it's all glowing uh, blue that means there's way too much bad bacteria in that water. Um, that would not be safe to drink by any means, and I wouldn't recommend even swimming in it. So what we do on a weekly basis, we test the water at our beaches uh, for bacteria, good and bad, and then we post those results on a website called BeachGuard, Ohio Beach Guard. So you can look up um, anywhere in Ohio uh, that they test and post those results, you might be able to see uh, if there's high bacteria counts. Um, all the MWCD uh, beaches have information there. Okay, now what eats the bacteria? The bacteria are interestingly enough the base of our food chain and they provide energy for our macroinvertebrates later on and there's uh, a group of animals we can call microinvertebrates or zooplankton. So we're going to use a little dropper and a glass slide, and we're going to take a little drop of water. Now these animals 
They don't get any bigger than this. This is their, this, their full grown adults will live their whole life uh, in this drop of water in the lake. And so I have on my computer a live sample. So you're going to see some things moving around. These are not bacteria. These are the little animals that are going to eat the bacteria. Okay. And remember, this is a highly concentrated sample. This is hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water, lake water. So you're not going to see this in just a normal drop. So hopefully it comes up on the screen a little bit. What we have here is a giant rotifer. I guess that's a relative scale. And rotifers, you can see it cleaning and feeding on the bacteria right now. You can't see the bacteria because it's smaller. We need to magnify this more. But we have lots of these rotifers, different species that swim around and constantly filter the water. So we go from back good bacteria to rotifers, and then we'll get to larger animals. Here's our larval clams that Heather talked about. They're, they start off their life microscopically, and then they'll get bigger. And then maybe we'll find a larger zooplankton like this guy. This one has huge antenna and one eye spot. Maybe you're a SpongeBob fan. You recognize plankton here. Uh, they swim through the water and they will eat uh, smaller zooplankton. And then that will turn into baby fish, larger fish, um, turn into food for our osprey and eagles. And, you know, sometimes me if I go fishing. So that's our, our food chain, starting with bacteria, moving up. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Louis, I think, for kind of a, a wrap up. And uh, I'll entertain questions, of course, anytime. Thank you, Matt. We're going to try to do a summarize what Heather, Matt, and we talked about earlier in this session and some things that you can do at home or with your troop or with your friends or groups of friends uh, and talk about what you can do to help keep water clean. Some of the action items we can do, you can volunteer. You can volunteer with Scenic Rivers. Heather was talking about our, our testing, uh, water quality testing volunteers that we have. If you would like to do that, you'll get a hold of ODNR and Heather and stuff. You can also visit one of our parks, whether it be a state park or one of our Muskegon watershed parks. You can visit our park and some of our naturalists. You can go to a nature program. And we have pro uh, programs that we do with water quality where you can go out on the creek and we'll be collecting some of these uh, macro and micro invertebrates. And we have telescopes here and we'll go out and collect them and, and do different activities like that. Also, your troop or your group can come out and organize a litter program. We're always looking for people to come out, especially picking up litter around our rivers and lakes and streams. And we do that quite often. Just call the local park and ask them if you'd like to do a service project or you'd like to do something, and we would organize that for you. Another thing you could do at home is just pick up after your pet and dispose of that properly. Another thing that you can do too is conserve water. Some different ways that you can conserve water is taking shorter showers, maybe turning off um, the water when you're brushing your teeth. Uh, just simple things like that. Maybe recycling water by collecting water uh, rainwater from the gutters and use that for your gardens. Another thing is do is create a garden, a water garden area where water can retain there and uh, you can grow plants that are a little bit like the water and you have like a small water garden as well. Another thing we ask you to do is don't treat your, your sink or toilet as a disposal area. Don't put your uh, medications down the sink or the toilet. Go ahead and take this to a pharmacy or call up one of your local health departments and ask where you could turn those in. Uh, some other things that we can do is make sure that your car is properly fixed. We notice that when we have a driveway on roadways, we have cars that are leaking a motor fuel, that are leaking antifreeze, those types of things. They leak onto those hard surfaces, and when it rains, it washes it into our waterways. So we want to be real uh, careful about that, uh, getting those toxic chemicals into our water, waterways and things. Uh, the other thing we can do is we can also recycle and reuse things. So plastic seems to be one of our biggest culprits in our environment that can last there for centuries. You're not even sure how long it can last. 
So whatever we can do to reduce the use or recycle things, that's going to be a good thing and help us with the water quality. So remember, whatever you do at home has an impact come downstream. So when you uh, wash that water down the sink or take that shower, that water is running into a watershed, which is going into a river, which eventually is ending up in the oceans. So it's really important that what we do here uh, is important for what is downstream. All right, turn it over to Heather for a wrap up or? Um. Well, actually, could I ask a question that we had come in and um, I'm not sure who the right person to answer this is, but Sasha from Long Island um, is very curious how dams protect the environment. She says she knows they protect us from floods, but what do they do for nature? Oh, you're you're mu muted, Louie. OK. It protects uh, good habitats because many of the lakes and reservoirs that we have uh, also have riparian right-of-ways and also we help control the erosion and also the sediments going down into. So we act as, as a buffer zone for those types of things that might get into the environment. So our stream areas is coming in here. We're helping control that sediment that's going downstream. We're also providing wetland areas and habitats for a lot of different species. Here at Pleasant Hill, the, the, the dam has created a lake and we have osprey and bald eagles nesting here. We also have a lot of different types of fish and animals that call this. So it's a micro habitat, but also we all offer for recreational areas as well. So it only benefits wildlife, it benefits people as well. Okay, and I, um, before I turn it back to Heather, I just want to give a shout out to some of the the girls that um, have that are joining us today. There's a ton of them, so I'm not going to be able to read all of them, but I want to say hello to Ellie. She's a brownie from Maryland. Thank you, Ellie, for joining us. Caitlin from Michigan, Peggy from Connecticut. We have Abigail from Bainbridge, Georgia, Virginia from Detroit, Michigan. And Penelope, I'm not sure where Penelope is from, but she has um, said hello to us and we want to say hi back and thank you for joining us. Michaela from Texas. Um, so we have people from all over and we're just so happy that we have Girl Scouts um, joining us for our, our program today. Thank you all. Um, and then I will turn it back to Heather. We have just a few minutes left before we're going to have to sign off and get on with our, our next program, which is um, about turtles and some creek creatures. And um, that will be starting in about fifth. Well, what time does that start? Is it noon? Yes, at noon. It's at noon. <laughs> OK, here you go, Heather. All right, thanks, Alyssa. Um, yes, uh, like Lisa said, we have one more um, segment that is a part of our three part uh, Mohican Crawdad Derby. So our first one this morning was on crawdads. Today you just learned a little bit about um, water pollution, how to prevent it, how we test for it. Next, um, we're going to have naturalist Lauren from our, one of our state parks talk about river critters and turtles. I've heard she's had a couple different um, turtles to share with us. Um, so thank you for joining us and I um, I hope you'll stay on um, for our um, segment that starts at noon. Alyssa did put in the Q&A um, a link on how to get to that one if you don't have it already. So thanks everybody. All right, have a good one.